So first of all, tell us a little bit about this book. I mean, a book is no easy task to begin with. Why this topic? Why did you write it? What, what's it all about? OK. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marcus Evans and uh, Maya, for, for inviting me. It's my pleasure and, and honor to be here with you all in the early morning. I have had the good fortune in the past uh, nine years of having mentored and coached hundreds of high achieving uh, students through my career, through my previous company, my current company, and through other things that I've done. In addition to being a new author, now I've, I run a company called 3EQ, which is a private mentoring um, service company for primarily high net worth and, and a higher um, uh, families, as well as a business advisory firm for uh, corporations. And I'm very selective when it comes to uh, clients here. But I realize that you know, the missing piece is that I'm not really contributing to the world by just running a sort of like a private bank, right, with high-end clients here. The only vehicle for me to do that is to get a book out there so that no matter what social economic standard, standing you have, you are able to benefit from the, some of my teachings and some of the secrets that I have instilled and, and, uh, and I get my mentees and students to internalize. And thus, I spent literally about 2,000 hours, I'm not kidding you, two years. And, and I put together a team of 23 kids, uh, 17 to 24-year-old leaders, to be exemplars of part of what I do. And these kids, are, go, they go to all the top schools. And, and, um, and the, the point is not about elite schools. The point is really for me to, to provide inspiration, provide guidance through storytelling. What can I do to um, help instruct and inspire and, and also maybe even uh, uh, help parents to take parenting to the next level here? So overall genesis is really to, 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 to pluck a hole in the targets that I serve. So going back to why is it important to me, my mission in life is actually very simple, and that is to empower young leaders and to advance tomorrow's competitive businesses. That's all I do. So I figured that a great way is to, okay, from the stories of these kids, okay, these kids who go to a um, lot of the top schools. Now, just for, just for easy to communicate purposes here, and I realize that there's a lot of bright kids who do not go to uh, top tier schools, okay? So the point, again, is not about elite schools. But it's easier to say that I got kids from all the AI league schools. And these are kids that are entrepreneurial in the aspirations, in the interests, in the passions, past, present, maybe aspirational. Um, and these are kids that are future politicians, future anthropologists, future maybe even journalists. Very wide variety. And I take you through an exciting and engaging journey, um, really through their hearts, minds, and transformations um, of what they've been through since family, family values, high school, college and university admissions, uh, transition into college, college life, mm -hmm. internships, uh, summer activities in high school and in college or university, um, and jobs, career, career planning. How do you manage failure? It's huge. Right. How do you overcome obstacles? How do you become successful? How do you raise your effective or pragmatic emotional, social, and leadership intelligence? So lots of storytelling here. I think it's wonderful that you've written this because a lot of kids out there, they're, they're probably born being naturally very entrepreneurial, but perhaps their parents are not entrepreneurial. Yes. So, so this sort of gives them a, a shortcut, and mm. some guidance on, on how to get how to, how to get forward in business. So, so what are the tips that you give them on managing failure? Because that is a huge part of being a business person so that they don't get discouraged when they have their first defeat. Yes. I think um, unless we fail or unless we go through some struggles towards a purposeful outcome, we're not going to succeed. Because no one is perfect. Um, no one is able to solve a complex problem perfectly through steps one, two, three, and that's it. I bet you along the way, no matter how smart you are, we're going to make some mistakes. And we're going to struggle a little bit here based on all sorts of reasons why. Maybe it's in your belief system. Maybe it's some negative self-talk. 
maybe some self-doubt. Maybe uh, your US parents are a little bit too tough on a kid, or maybe the kid's too lazy, or all sorts of reasons, right? External reasons here. And overall, I believe that without some failure and overwhelm, we're not gonna succeed. That's it. And especially in, I grew up in San Francisco, but I'm an immigrant from Asia, so I have Asian blood. I speak fluent Cantonese, and, but I'm also American. I see both sides very deeply and very clearly, right? And one thing around the world that I've seen, unlike in certain pockets in the, in the world where the tolerance for failure is much higher, the threshold for failure and encouragement to fail based on calculated risks, it's actually okay. Um, but I think in many parts of the world, that's not really culturally embedded as much, although the world is changing right now. So I think uh, overall, um, struggling, it's a good thing. I think it's a great way to learn in, in many, many contexts too. So the tolerance for failure and making mistakes is higher in the West, in the U.S.? Um, I would say I would not categorize the West or the East because there's many, many very astute entrepreneurs and, and, uh, and uh, folks in this room. Uh, certainly, and you know, being Asian myself, I could certainly see the creativity as well in, in, in our ways uh, in Asia. Um, but I think um, there are certain uh, cultures overall on average that are probably higher context compared to the lower context, like uh, certain parts of America, not all. So I think uh, there are some good nuts that we could extract from parts of a culture or business, ways and means that work and then kind of map it over, mix with your lo local cultures and with that creative implosion. I think it's a good thing. That's how a lot of innovation gets, um, you know, kind of renaissance period type mm -hmm. of thinking here. It's a mindset. What are the tips that you give for managing stress? Stress, okay. I find that a lot of kids, and same for a lot of adults, um, what I've learned is that from, my, from what I learned from some of the endorsers, these guys tell me that, Jason, your book is absolutely inspiring and useful uh, for kids, teenagers and 20-somethings, and for parents. I say, thank you very much. But guess what? It's actually totally applicable for me as an executive, okay? As a middle-aged, great hair, 40, 50-year-old, 60-year-old executive. And, and we, we get stressful because we're so overwhelmed with so many priorities with a deadline or certain things that we really want to apply and accomplish, but we feel that we probably don't have enough time to do that right now. And I look at it in two ways. One way are, is your immediate presence, is your immediate what's in front of you, what do you need to get done right now. But most importantly, the private mentees that I, that I have, be them teenagers or 20-somethings, or, or CEOs or executives, right? Um, I, would, I would really spend time going into the temple of the soul and mind. So I find that a lot of the stress really comes from, it's, it's really maybe you were too distracted with, you're focusing on distractions in some ways. And sometimes people say, oh, I don't have time for that. Mm. I'm stressful. It's not because they don't have time for that. Maybe they have been mis misallocating their time and they have not strategically prioritized and embedded into the belief system and into their the outcome focus uh, strategy, their purpose and, and the action plan, such that it allows them a lot more time to do some of the things they like, they, they, they like to accomplish here. There, there are routines that we could do. Um, I think a lot of it is really, once again, goes back into your belief system, into your self-talk, maybe even language with other people. Take care of your body, it's very important. Body and mind and soul work, work together. I think uh, one tip about managing stress is to really breathe, your breathing pattern. Um, and then when you're, when you're really stressed, your body gets numb, or maybe certain, depends on how you, you know, depends on you. Get up, do some breathing exercises, do some stretch, or ex jumping jacks. And, and uh, I, I, I do that. And uh, you know, I am, I am uh, just like you, I'm in the tail end of a baby boomer generation. And uh, like, I'm not as comfortable because I work out three times a week. In the past week, it's been very, very busy with a full-time conference, and I just flew here yesterday from the United States. And I just got, very quickly, I booked a massage, I worked out, had a late dinner, and I got some sleep. And I find that we are all very busy 
But for me, despite my busy schedule, I tell myself that, all right, Jason, schedule your work around your sleep. No matter how busy we are, I get on average eight hours of sleep a day, times seven, 56 hours per week, despite my crazy schedule. I think it's really how you strategically and emotionally and also logically and systematically manage your, your life and your business. How do you advise young people who are so focused on getting into university? Remember what that was like, and, and you're, you're checking off your list of all of the things you need to do and your extracurricular activities, and I'm going through it now with, with my kid. He's starting to get things together. Um, how do you instill that sense of balance? How do you encourage that? It's a, uh, it kind of depends on a continuum that, that makes sense. And and I would never generalize anything about college and university. Okay. So let's say that if you go to a school that cares about only test scores and only grades for as admission criteria, then certainly you have to make sure you spend a lot of time and effort strategically and tactically doing real well in getting those results down. Let's say that on the flip side, on the other extreme, if you want to apply to top tier universities in the United States here. The process uh, for the couple of years before the college application period, okay. When I say college, I really mean university and beyond high school. Besides getting strong grades and, and curriculum and getting high SAT scores um, and high, or high S ACT or writing scores um, or, you know, and as well as SAT subject tests or SAT two scores, okay. Those are just getting into the ballpark because the world is getting so competitive every single year, more and more competitive. It's supply and demand, that's all. Okay. The number of admission slots are always fairly constant. A lot of it is really based on physical limits of dormitories available to house students. But the number of applicants, based on a variety of reasons, people get smarter, people learn more from me, from others, et cetera, read books. And kids and parents are getting more and more informed, especially with internet. Okay, so the number of applicants keep on rising here. So the mid-rates keep on dropping. Getting into many Ivy League schools around 10% or less. Many top schools, 15%, 20%. Now, besides that, you also have to demonstrate strong character, your story. Sometimes in places who your parents are, how implicitly they can help the schools. It's a very complex criteria, tactically, your essays are very important, long essays, short essays, recommendation letters from teachers, instructors, and school report from the guidance counselor. And overall, what is your story? How strong are your, is your story? And how different is your story and attractive that makes a great fit between the school and you as an applicant? Mm -hmm. That's a very complex equation too. It changes every year based on a variety of criteria, um, and sometimes based on also politics within the university, and based on certain goals that they have. The board of trustees, the board of directors, and then the faculty in a university has a lot of clout as well. It's not surprising to see many, many top schools where the sons and daughters and nephews of some pretty influential professors, they might have a private networking type of uh, influence. And then there are uh, a number of uh, students that, that get admitted that, may, that come from a very uh, rather social, economically disadvantaged uh, families. But overall, it's a pretty complex equation. And it's, um, but it's doable though. So Jason, what's the advice, when they get through university okay. or college, what's the advice that you give them when they're trying to make their way in the professional world? Now, one, once you're in college and university, um, and once again, it's very contextual. I will not generalize things. If you go to a fantastic university in Asia, such as, say, in Tsinghua, Beida, uh, in, in China, Tokyo University, Korea, you know, in Southeast Asia, Singapore, uh, NUS, et cetera, that's just fantastic options that you have here, right? Um, so I think overall, in college, of course, uh, work on learning, truly demonstrate intellectual and uh, maybe a bit of emotional curiosity too. And that's one thing that a lot of the top schools in the States are pretty good in providing in terms of a platform because in order to get in, the kit's already pretty, pretty awesome, right? 
So you have this really peer-to-peer -peer influence and peer-to-peer -peer inspiration and peer-to-peer -peer teaching. Because oftentimes, the one key reason you want to go to a top school, of course, you get great education as well. But I tell you, a lot of top schools are pretty similar in terms of the quality of the education. But the quality of the peers are quite different. Mm. If you go to Stanford, imagine the average quality of your peer okay, versus the average quality of a school that's, say, in a second tier. Can you imagine the difference? Can you imagine you're surrounded by people that are as awesome or more awesome than you are? Not, not from a conceited standpoint, but from a roly roly, you can learn from each other. Mm. Like you folks are very successful. You're surrounding, you're, you're amongst uh, the top of the game. In college, likewise, very important for kids to really become really good and effective networking, learning from each other, participate in activities, in clubs, in the community, get internships is important. Get practical skills. I also write for Forbes. My, uh, my uh, title is, is author uh, of a Young Leaders 3.0, uh, Stories, Insights, and Tips for Next Generation Achievers. And I cover primarily uh, college admissions. I cover uh, leadership. I cover entrepreneurship. I cover what it takes to become a leader for, for a long, long time, kids, adults. I just wrote an article about 12 of today's uh, most impressive young entrepreneurs. And then my next one is going to be about alternative experiential education away from a college campus here. Mm. Because we find that if you're an employer, if the student does not have the skills you're looking for, does not have the character of strength you're looking for, and you really want to fill a key position, would you like to hire them? No. I will politely guide them to do something else. But overall, in summary, in college and university, really get involved in fruitful, purposeful activities, make friends, learn from peers, learn from professors, make friends with professors as well, get internships, get out into the community. All right, how do you check someone's character? Isn't that something that needs to be tested under pressure before you can get an accurate reading? Yes. Um, it's very hard to, to test someone's character by being a grocery store manager and kind of do a five-second glance on a person before you accept his or her credit card. It doesn't work like that. Um, a, you know, the way that I, it really takes experience in some ways, right? It depends. When I talk to people, maybe I've been doing this for a long time, I ask them questions. And I ask them in certain ways based on who I think they are. And I'm very open-minded in listening. I kind of want to draw them out. Depends on how they, how they answer, how they behave, how they play golf, how they play basketball, how they do certain things, right? Because behavior, actions, and decisions, how we conduct ourselves, are really affects on it. Now, oftentimes, I may not be able to assess so soon, but certain people I can assess pretty quickly. So the character is really cause and effect and based on the patterns of what I've seen on the effect side, then I could kind of be part of the character. Okay, fascinating. Really great skill to have. So based on these assessments, what do you think are some of the characteristics that make a great entrepreneur or someone who would do really well in a family business? Mm, okay. Entrepreneurship, um, building a company, um, and there's some correlation to building a family business or taking over a family business as well, correct? So when you look, first of all, it's people, the teamwork. And typically, when, I hire people, when, when VCs invest in certain entrepreneurs, I look at a combination of, of the team, the market, the founders. I could tell whether they're going to get along or potentially they could fight and they could say split. If that happens here, if I feel that, I'm not going to even touch it. Mm. Okay. Market, is it the right timing? You climb on the right wall, not the wrong wall. The worst situation is that you are working real hard but spend a lot of time on the wrong market segment, right? based on your skill set, based on your heart. Right? And the third thing is really your innovation, correct? Um, and it's really you know, your innovation, your market, the team, and then the structure so far. If a structure is sort of, you know, kind of, it's not investable, it's not scalable, then if, if, if they're not willing to listen based on character team and to restructure, then no thank you. Because there's too many choices here. And I encourage you all to go to Jason Ma, Forbes, and go to my column, Forbes.com column. My latest article is what I mentioned before. It's 12 of today's um, most impressive entrepreneurs. So, so many people in this room are in charge of hiring for, mm. for their companies. What are some tips for senior executives if they're hiring and trying to 
develop millennials as employees and part of, and a part of their team? Very, very good question. Pick up my book. Um, my book is soft launched already. It's on Amazon. And I'm learning, for example, from Jonathan Rosenberg, one of my uh, new friends. He's a former senior vice president of products at Google. So most of us use his products on a daily basis here. And he wrote a book with Eric Schmidt, the former CEO and chairman of Google, about how Google works. He tells me, uh, frankly, in a, literally in a micro essay, as is an endorsement on, on uh, inside the book, said, Jason, your book is very inspiring and super useful for parents, oh my god, for kids. Kids meaning teenagers and uh, even younger, OK? Uh, elementary school kids and element, uh, middle school kids, 20-somethings, even 30s. And, but it's very useful for me as an executive. Why? Because middle-aged people, we're about the same age in our 50s, right? And because a lot of us do not understand kids anymore. They're very digital. Are they from Mars? <laughs> oh my god, are they from Venus? <laughs> and the book uh, shows you how they think, what's in the hearts, how they really work, what works for them, what doesn't work. For them. There's a lot of myths. Because you want to groom them and empower them for them to do a great job working with you. They feel a sense of fulfillment, growth, contribution, engagement, et cetera, uh, connection. And uh, you also want to support them to maybe some of them to take over. If you're in family business, of course you want your kids to take over your business. Uh, but that also has to make sure that there's alignment. If there's no spiritual, emotional alignment, good luck, right? And that's part of what I do too, is to work with select um, you know, family offices and, and corporations here and help you make sure that the operating system in your brain and heart and applications in your brain and heart and your nervous system individually and organizationally is really quality, okay? It's really of quality because if it's not of quality, you have the great hardware, but your software inside you is really not of quality yet. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have problems in the future. We've got about 10 minutes left. Put up your hand if you have a question. In the meantime, uh, we can talk a little bit about coaching because this is something that you've been doing. You're enjoying this, the coaching aspect of it, aren't you? I can feel I, it. I love it, I love it. That's my passion. I love one-on-one -on -one mentoring kids and also you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, helping parents that become better parents and helping executives and CEOs become even better CEOs and executives, right? It's a fun thing, right? It's a fun thing for me. And I get paid for it uh, rather handsomely. And <clears throat> I do that for my firm 3EQ. That's part of what it provides. It's really high-end. It's really a powerful one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Whether your kid is a young teenager or a late teenager or 20-something, or you got a 35-year-old kid, okay? Maybe you yourself would like to have some private exclusive behind the scenes uh, coaching on a sustainable fashion, maybe for three months, maybe for two years. And in order for you to do a, maybe help you take yourself to the next level. And I, th I find it to be just very, basically what I do is very simple. It's what the family, schools, and the community are not doing a great job in, in helping you get there. I fill in as an overlay, but as a very private and personalized overlay. It's very personalized. Mm -hmm. But through my framework, I have a systematic framework and step-by-step. And -step. But it's very personalized based on the situation, the individual and the family. So it's very dynamic because if you're at a stage in life, you're in, sta you're in a stage in life, you get older, you have different needs and wants mm -hmm. and situations. And it's very contextual. That's why I use the word contextual. I will use it. I'm sorry. But it's all relative, isn't it? And you could go to my uh, 3eq.com. My email is jma, J-M-A at 3, T-H-R-E-E, -E, mm -hmm. eq.com. That's my uh, website name as well. And my book is, uh, but 3eq.com, you see that it's more private, it's more buttoned down, high end. Now this website, youngleaders3.com, is youthful, is, is sort of mass appeal, it's a very different thing. And as we speak, I'm also beefing up my youngleaders3.com website. And I'm also coming up with a jasonlmott.com website because I want to provide more resources online for people to find me and, and so I can serve you, serve people in more ways than just a book. Jason, I'm going to get some coaching advice from you now okay. for, for everyone in this room. 
You've mentioned self-talk yes. several times. How do you change that? If you, if you hit this point in life, you're middle-aged and, mm. and, and you still have a habit of negative mm. self-talk or imposter syndrome is another one that we hear about a lot. Yes. Um, you just feel like, okay, I've hit this point because of luck. It's mm. not because of skill. How do you change that once you've gone beyond your adolescent years? Right. Now, very good question. Um, of course, once you go beyond your, say, early 20s, uh, late teens, then we get a bit more hardwired, more and more. But everyone can change. I have succeeded in changing after years of trying to get my 82-year-old mother to go to church. Not that she's Christian, she's a Buddhist. The reason for that is that she has, my, my dad's got stage four cancer and he's 90 years old, okay? And my sister has had, uh, you know, my, my family is not all hunky-dory. I went through some, you know, my family went through some hardships before. And the reason is to find her, her give her more spirituality, find more centeredness, um, give her a, a sense of uh, feeling a bit more stable, have more camaraderie, have more friends, learn from a pastor. She's not a Christian. But I even got her flip open and read the Bible. Now, I'm not Christian. And my family's Christian. But I, I actually am going through the Bible myself. And that's a tip of what we can do as middle-aged people, as anyone. It's really, no matter how busy we are, hey, listen, I work 80 hours a week. Now, I say that out of lightheartedly as well. Because a lot of my work is, to, is reading books. I spend a few dozen hours reading books, listening to audio books and podcasts. And audio is very convenient, hotel room. I'm making coffee. Sometimes I just want to get up and walk and listen to audiobook in a week. Um, so I think one good way, one good tactic is to maybe start or restart or maybe be a bit more aggressive on listening to audiobooks. Here's another very good example. The most powerful person in my life who's an adult is my wife. After years of inspiring, motivating, sometimes nagging, whatever, she has finally found her autopilot of listening to audiobooks. Just in the past month or month and a half, she's been on fire going through a lot of audiobooks in my old iPhone. I just picked up a new iPhone 6, which I love, right? I showed her. The key thing is to make it easy for her, showed her, encouraged her, condition. Once I condition and all that love, nurture, sometimes a little bit you know, tough love as, as well. You have to do that with each other, right? And, and now she loves it. I go home after a trip. She tells me, oh, honey, I'm on to this book already. I said, you blow me away, honey. I'm proud of you. <laughs> I'm proud of you. So by doing that, then she, she enhances her own mindset. She enhances part of her skill set. She's moving in a more clearer direction. And uh, by, by doing that, then the causes of that, that'll result in better decisions in the future too. Less time to do and discuss certain things and make better decisions. Along the way in between, the self-talk on average gets a little bit better. Wonderful. Jason, we're out of time. Oh, before we wrap this up, any questions from anyone? A little quiet crowd today. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. Very insightful, very interesting. Thank you so much for inviting. And Jason's going to be available outside to, to chit-chat about coaching and different things. So please um, come up and say hello to him. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So good.